Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trama Verification's August Q&A Web Conference. For best sound quality, we recommend that you connect to audio by telephone. If you are not currently connected by phone, look at the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Select audio and then select the phone and the dial-in number will appear. I would now like to introduce Molly Lazada, Trauma Verification Program Manager. Thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So for today's webinar, it'll be Rachel Tanchez, the Site Visit Coordinator, and myself. Um, just going over some things. Uh, continuing education to qualify for CE. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the educational content. An email will be sent to all attendees who qualify for CE within 24 hours of the webinar, ending with instructions on how to claim those CE. If you have any questions during the webinar or at any time, please feel free to email us at cotvrc.facs.org. The goal for today's webinar is to inter interpret the standards outlined in the Resources for Optimal Care of the Injured Patient Manual to ensure that hospitals have an understanding of the criteria to provide quality care to the injured patient. Understand the processes and standards involved in an ACS trauma verification site visit and how following these will positively impact the quality of care of the injured patient at your trauma center. So with that said, let's get started. Um, again, if you have a copy of the Orange Book, uh, please have that readily available. If not, you may download a copy which is available online. Uh, you can download that as a PDF copy. And in conjunction with the manual, you must have the clarification document and the change log um, with you because changes made to the requirement or any clarifications with the requirement, it'll be noted in one of those two documents. Um, as stated, the clarification document will house those questions or those requirements that need some clarification. And again, that is going to be in the clarification document. Any changes to the requirements regarding a standard will be noted in the change log, uh, what we're calling the verification change log. And both, those, both of those documents can be found on the resources website in the middle of your page. And these are just screenshots of what the documents look. They're a little different. Uh, the verification change log is just an Excel worksheet and you can uh, filter that as you like. The recording of these webinars um, will be posted at, within a week of this um, recording to the ACS YouTube channel and the link is in the middle of the page. Just as a point of reference, if you're looking for um, past Recordings, they are also located on this web page and uh, um, they're at, noted at the bottom of the page. So you're going to need to scroll down towards the bottom. And sorry about that. It's just a very lengthy page. All questions are pulled directly from the questions that were submitted. There have been no edits made to the content. So if there's any misspellings, um, that's how we pull those uh, questions from the portal. If your question is not answered during today's uh, webinar, the question may require more information, which we will follow up with you following the, um, following the webinar, or you will receive a response from the ACS staff within the following week. Just a few announcements. The next webinar is going to be scheduled for Wednesday, September 20th. The deadline to submit questions for that webinar will be September 8th and our standard time will be noon to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I'm gonna go ahead and um, let Rachel uh, provide some updates on the TQIP conference. So as you all probably already know, the 2017 TQIP Annual Scientific Meeting and Training will be November 11th through the 13th at the Hilton Chicago. And registration is open as well as hotel reservations um, are open as too. And um, you'll find more information at the link listed on the page. And as a reminder, um, there are also a variety of pre-conference workshops in which you could sign up for. And you'll see some listed on the slide here, but you'll also find more uh, detailed listing at that link provided. And I also want to add for new participants that are on the call, um, 
just a point of reference, Topic is a great course. Um, if you've never taken Topic before, it actually covers uh, PI and, um, and uh, actually it's very beneficial for trauma centers that are seeking verification. And um, if you've never taken the optimal course, another uh, course that would be extremely beneficial for trauma centers who have undergone a verification visit or will be pursuing verification because it, it, it does follow the course of the book um, and how that site visit will look um, at the time of a visit. So it just goes through step by step on what is expected during a site visit. And again, it does cover the entire uh, resources manual um, by chapter as well. Um, one of the things that I do wanna bring to your attention is um, the stakeholder public uh, comment website. It's actually the resources revision process that we're undergoing as we speak. And I put a little table together so um, you can get an idea of what we're uh, working on next and how this is going to look. And what we're trying to do is just make everything very succinct. Um, and we started with Chapter 6, which is the general surgery chapter. So we finished that chapter. It's not been released. We don't have any dates of when that will be released. Um, but just letting you know that we have revised that. We have completed it. And our goal uh, for the next... Uh, uh, specialty chapters, emergency medicine, neurosurgery, orthopedic, including pediatric, um, the, the plan is that we are going to make these all very, very similar in the content and the language, especially when it comes to board certification and um, CME, um, the language will be very similar and um, Again, just wanted to provide you with the snapshot of what's upcoming. And if you have not done so yet, uh, please visit our website. You can find us on, you can find us through the public uh, comment set as you see here, this link. And you can also access this through the DRC resources webpage. We do have a link there that will connect you to that. Um, but I strongly encourage anyone who um, has any input or any questions or anything that you want to see changed or anything you want to see improved or modified as far as standards go to visit our webpage and give us some information and just ensure that um, if you're going to want us to change something to provide some evidence base or some documentation that supports the change. So we're super excited. Um, we're now on, uh, working with Chapter 10 Pediatric. Uh, as many of you know, that's a very extensive chapter and I'm really, really excited that we're working on that chapter with the work group, and uh, um, it'll be some time before that's finalized, but uh, we've already um, uh, completed our first conference call just to review the um, CDs or requirements, if you will, for consideration. Um, but again, these, this is what's upcoming. You have all your specialty chapters, including um, trauma registry and the research chapter. Um, just again, another reminder for a couple of things that we have now um, um, implemented or it's available on the resources webpage, which is the frequently asked document um, uh, questions rather. Um, and we're starting pretty small right now. We have uh, 12 questions and we're going to build off of that um, document and continue to build that so that way it's um, you know, for new centers or even existing centers to go to this document and find uh, these questions that are commonly asked and have a, uh, a standard response there. Um, they're going to be, again, it's on the trauma verification FAQs. It's the VRC standards FAQs. Um, they're going to be uh, displayed by level and by category. Again, currently we only have 12 only because we're going to continue to build off of that and uh, I'll have more information as um, that um, is implemented. Uh, just again, another reminder for new trauma centers or new trauma program managers that are looking for information on becoming a verified trauma center and what that entails and what is needed to begin the process. Um, and this will, again, will be another series that I, I will be building um, during the year. So. Um, Take a look at that and, and hopefully um, you'll find that very beneficial to your scheduling your first uh, site visit with us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and do some scheduling reminders. Site visit application. Um, the applications for your site visit must be received in our office 13 to 14 months before your visit. Um, this gives you plenty of time to prepare for the visit 
in, um, to complete the online PRQ, and it also holds your spot for your site visit. And at this time, we are completely booked all the way through August 2018. And uh, for September of 2018, there's just a few more uh, available spots. So along with that, I just want to let some folks know that um, there's some information that you need to submit with the site visit application. Um, I know it's in, at times it may be a little confusing, but um, if you're a level one trauma center, we want not only the site visit application, but we also want the OTL form, which is the orthopedic traumatologist leader um, form. Um, and that's because that form, uh, once it's completed, it does go through a series of um, approvals through our subcommittee, which is the orthopedic subcommittee. Um, that's not something the office does. It, it does go through a, a, a vetting process, if you will. So we need that form completed and submitted to us. In addition, um, and this is for any trauma center level, if you have um, any surgeons that are not U.S. boarded, or Canadian boarding, and we're not talking about those that are recent graduates and they're just w waiting to become boarded. We're talking about those that have trained abroad um, and are working at your facility. If they've never been through the alternate, alternate pathway process, we will need a copy of their CV along with their name and their specialty. And that as well um, is vetted through, again, another um, through our subcommittee, if it's a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon, um, they are vetted through those specialty groups. Um, but again, if you do have any new members to your trauma panel that, that require that, we'll need that. Um, but if you have any panel members that have gone through that process in the past and were approved in the past, we're just simply asking uh, for you to um, note their name and their specialty. They will not be required to repeat the process. Uh, again, this just goes into a little bit more information about the OTL form. Um, many, we're coming up to a three-year cycle right now, so we may have a lot of these uh, fellowships. Um, we're running a, a list of all these fellowships, so we may already have the fellowships um, noted along with your OTL leader. But again, we're still continuing to require that form for the time being. Uh, for combined trauma centers that are level one adult and level one PEDS, we are asking you to complete those forms. And uh, again, um, depending on who's going to have their survey first, we're only going to ask for uh, a few questions uh, for the second trauma center to complete a few questions on the OTL form, which is noted here. Again, this is just going into the alternate pathway request, um, as I mentioned before, because there seems to be some confusion going on about um, um, the alternate pathway and who can qualify this. So again, if you're, if you do have panel members who have not been board certified here in the U.S. or trained here in the U.S. and just simply never went and became board certified for whatever reason, um, this alternate pathway does not apply to them. They cannot apply for the alternate pathway. Um, so the alternate pathway as it is now is only for those surgeons or physicians, if you will, who trained abroad and are not U.S. or Canadian trained. Um, and again, we do want their name on the site visit application and also a copy of their CV. Um, but I will say this, if you have a visit, if you are outside that 15-month uh, window that we keep referring to about um, scheduling your visit and, I don't know, you're maybe two years ahead and you know this physician is going to be at your trauma center at the time of the site visit, you can definitely be proactive and submit that, that, that information to us. You don't necessarily have to wait for the site visit application to be submitted. So um, it's something that we still we will do, and, and that way you at least you'll know ahead of time um, how that, uh, if that uh, provider will be approved. So this next slide is in regards to pre-review pre questionnaire, online access. Um, when your application is received in our office, um, you are going to receive an email receipt. And in the context of that email are going to be your PRQ logins. So you'll want to hold on, hold on to this uh, email so you can refer back to it. 
And uh, the online PRQ can be accessed at this link listed here. And also a copy of the PRQ in Word can be downloaded from the link listed. Um, so in regards to the site visit application payment, we ask that you please do not submit your payment with your application uh, because your center is going to be billed annually for the trauma quality program fee. Um, and, and of course, this, this does not include fees for additional reviewers if needed. Um, at the link below, there's a really great fee structure um, with the fees for the next three years. So we encourage you to view it. And this slide is in regards to uh, scheduling site visits. Um, you should receive your site visit confirmation email by at least 90 days before your scheduled visit, give or take. And um, ideally, all visits will occur during your requested time frame. When a lead reviewer is available for your visit, we'll first contact the trauma program manager to confirm the dates and prior to final, that's prior to finalizing the visit. Um, we strive to get you your dates much earlier than before you receive your confirmation email so you and your team can prepare accordingly. Um, site visit preparation with reviewers. Reviewers will um, book their own flights through the ACS travel agent, um, and they do this approximately like 20 to 30 days prior to the visit. The hospital is responsible for the site reviewers' hotel accommodations, as well as their ground transportation. Um, the reviewers' uh, contact information will be provided in that confirmation email once the full team has been secured and you'll get that approximately 90 days before the visit. Um, also important, please uh, be sure to contact the reviewers directly within 30 days of the site visit. And this is just to email their hotel confirmations, um, uh, get their flight itineraries and coordinate ground transportation to and from the airport, hotel and hospital, and any other site, um, site visit logistics. So I'm just going to go over a couple of um, new staff that we've had um, in the past month. Um, and this is just for reports. And if anyone has questions about the standards, you can definitely um, reach us at the COTVRC at FACS.org. So we have Megan Hudgens and Bumi Parikh, who are the trauma verification coordinators who are processing your reports. And um, I'm super excited because now I have two staff members to cover that. And Kendra is actually um, my attempt who is assisting me with trauma verification as well. So I just want to make sure these names are, you're familiar with these names because you will be receiving or have been receiving emails from these folks. And I just want to let you know that they do work for me and the college. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and move on to general <laughs> questions. Um, this one I'm going to let Rachel cover. Okay, the question is, um, just to clarify, should centers expect VRC re-verification be the same year of the site survey is, wait, be the same year of the site survey is scheduled? Um, and the answer to that is that the center should expect an invoice for their re-verification visit approximately 60 days before their scheduled visit. Uh, so then this will include the annual fee for the re-verification and TQIP. And also, I want to let folks know that there is a, um, as Rachel mentioned earlier, um, there is a, on the verification resources webpage, there's a link that literally says fees and invoicing. So you can look at a three, um, like over the course of three years, what that fee process is going to be for your facility. So that way you can budget accordingly. So I had a question about appendix number two, as many of you have completed the PRQ. Um, question number, uh, our appendices are pretty detailed and we're asking for a lot of information in just a, a short form. So the question is regarding what do we mean by operative cases? So if you take a look at appendix number two, um, there is in the far right column, there is um, um, a column, there's two columns actually that say number of operative cases per year. We want we want 
those that are trauma and we also want those that are non-trauma. And basically the question is asking for the number of trauma and non-trauma operative cases for each trauma surgeon that is serving on your trauma call panel. And operative cases is defined as those that require general anesthesia in the operating room. So essentially your non-trauma, the non-trauma column is gonna be a much higher number than the trauma, just because if they're doing um, general surgery call, then that number is going to be a little, it's going to be higher, obviously, than trauma, or possibly not. It just depends on your trauma surgeon. Um, so I had a question about backup call schedule, uh, backup call trauma surgeon. Is it acceptable for trauma surgeons on the call panel to exclusively take backup call only and never take primary call? So the way I understood this question, and if I'm incorrect, please reach out to me, but the way I read this and my understanding of this question is, um, that, so it's an actual, so if the question is regarding the backup call schedule and not the on-call schedule, so basically some trauma, center ha trauma centers have an on-call schedule with who their primary is and who's going to back them up in case they're encumbered, and then there's trauma centers that have a separate backup call schedule and they have like three deep, if you will. In that instance, that would be acceptable because they're never going to be on primary call. They're just simply acting as backup surgeons when the need arises. So I hope that answered that question. If it did not, please reach, uh, contact me. Uh, EMS communication, what feedback is required for EMS? Um, the privacy officer at this, at this facility does not want outcomes or hospital care discussed with EMS. Well. It is, it is something that is essential um, that they do, that you do provide EMS some feedback. So um, as it says here, it is essential, it is an essential responsibility of the territory facility to provide specific feedback to referring facilities and free hospital providers. The feedback should include, it doesn't say it has to, but it should include final diagnoses, the general course and outcome of the patient, and any PI issues that the territory facility identified in the care provided prior to the arrival. So again, you can um, develop a process that's going to hopefully work for both EMS and your privacy officer, but this is an important responsibility of your facility to provide this feedback to, to EMS and vice versa. A uh, question about death and hospice. Um, this person actually listened to um, last month's webinar about hospice discharges, and they're asking um, to clarify the for uh, to clarify death hospice for ED discharge to hospice or just an inpatient discharge to hospice. I'm sorry. After listening to the last webinar about hospice discharges, would you do the same for ED discharge to hospice or just the inpatient discharge to hospice? A little confusing, but I think um, uh, hopefully again, if I answered, if I understand this correctly, uh, for verification purposes, again, your hospital may have a different policy, but for verification purposes, if the hospice patient was discharged from the ED to an external hospice facility or transferred to an internal hospice unit, not under the care of the trauma service, so I just want to make that clear, that case will not be reviewed. We want those hospice cases that were that are under the care of the trauma service, we do want you to review those. But once they're discharged to a, um, an external facility or to even your inpatient hospice unit, then there's no need to review those cases. We're not asking you to review those cases. You certainly can review those cases, but uh, for verification purposes, we're only asking to review those cases that are under the care of the trauma service. Uh, question about isolated hip fractures and same level falls. Do we have to keep isolated fall from standing hip fractures in our registry? I'm told by everyone that we must, but there really is no single straightforward answer. It is usually, it depends. Is the decision left up to the individual hospital? Our state does not want these patients submitted to them. Does CEQIP require it? So a lot of questions in this one little slide, and let me just phrase it this way. Um, this person is correct. The decision is uh, the decision decision to capture these patients is the trauma in the trauma registry will be defined by each individual hospital as part of the admission policy. And in some instances, if it is part if it's not part of your policy, but your state wants you to collect it, it's gonna mean you're gonna have to 
somehow collect that. So you're going to collect two, two sets of data points. Um, in other instances, um, if your policy or mission policy says to collect it, that you have to collect that, it's going to be in your registry, but your state doesn't want it, again, you're just going to have to um, figure out a way on how you're going to collect that data set. So again, it's going to depend on your admission policy at your trauma center um, uh, on how you want to capture those patients. Uh, travel nurses, what is the acceptable percentage of travel nurses staffing in the ED or ICU? Um, I thought this was a good question. Uh, currently, the number of nurses, whether it's travel nurses or just other, otherwise, um, you know, nurses that are employed by the hospital, um, the number of nurses that is acceptable or required to staff the ED has not been established. So we do not have a threshold of what that number is for to cover the ED. Um, however, uh, for the ICU, the patient to nurse ratio is, cannot exceed two to one. So it's, again, that is um, the patient to nurse ratio in the ICU must not exceed two to one. If travel nurses are used to provide care for trauma patients, they are required to meet the same requirements as the other nurses that are employed by the hospital, meaning they're going to undergo um, whatever the credentialing process at your facility is um, that would require them to continue with training or have training, uh, be certified or have certification and continue education. That all has to be the same for those travel nurses. So the requirement is the same. Verification site visit. Um, what happens after our level two initial verification site visit? What is what is what is the process and how long does it take? Um, so if this is referring to when a center receives its official notification that they are verified, there's a series of steps or processes, if you will, that the that the report undergoes. So following the site visit, the review team has 10 business days to submit their report. Um, once that report is received by, our, by the office, um, it does go through a series of editorial processes, one from our office staff, that being Boomi and Megan. The second is through clinical editors, which are current reviewers who are um, acting as our clinical editors. And following both of those editorial um, Steps, what may occur, and it doesn't always, but what may occur is that there may be some follow up questions or clarifications, and that may be directed to either the team or it may be directed to the facility. So I know there's been a series of emails that have gone out to some folks in regard to the tables. Um, there's been a lot of confusion in the tables regarding. Um, in the section two and in the pediatric uh, section of the PRQ. So what Boomi and Megan do is they go back to uh, you, the trauma program manager, and ask, and ask um, to balance or, if you will, um, yeah, balance out the tables because they do have there is a there is uh, they do have to match, and we actually have we're going to start posting that online actually what how those tables are going to match. So uh, for for some of you who have received an email from Boomi and Megan, you'll they'll ask you to um, to update the numbers in the tables because there's some uh, um, numbers that are not matching or don't balance, if you will. Um, so following that um, clarification portion of it, that report once we get that information back from you all. That report is then edited again, just a really quick edit just to update um, the data that you've provided. And then it does get uh, peer reviewed by the verification committee. Um, our committee is pretty big, so we have them divided into three subgroups, and one of the groups will receive um, the report for review. Um, that committee has um, between five to seven days to review that report and submit their, their findings to us if it, if it disagrees um, or if it agrees. Uh, we want that feedback back from the committee. And then that information is gathered and uh, sent to the VRC chairs uh, for adjudication uh, slash approval. So it, there's a series of steps that it goes through um, and the process can take up to 12 weeks. We are um, actually 
um, doing a lot better with this time. Um, so it could possibly be between 10 to 12 weeks that you may receive uh, your report. Um, so the other piece of this is um, as soon as the letter and reports are released to the trauma center and the trauma center is verified, the center will be automatically listed on the verification webpage as soon as that happens. There's no waiting for that. Electronic trauma flow sheet, um, if it meets requirement for auditing, why are reviewers stating you need to go back to the paper? So let me just say this, there is no requirement on this. What the VRC stands on this is that the electronic flow sheet must, content, uh, must um, I'm always gonna slaughter this name, <laughs> contemporaneously document the care of the patient, meaning it has to flow with the care of the patient uh, typically with electronic flow sheets, what happens is it's state stamped as soon as a key entry is made. And um, so we just want you to be cognizant of that date time uh, stamp um, because, you know, you don't want the patient um, admitted and having, I don't know, um, discharge and then having surgery because of that's when the key entry was made. So it has to, it has to be in the order of that the care was provided to to the patient. So what may happen during a site visit is that reviewers um, see a number of instances where that is just not accurately documented and it's not fixed. And it just, just, just because it's, you know, they're not aware of it. Um, so what they may propose that they, is that they revert back to the paper flow sheet until programming or maybe some education on how to um, document that in the ed ed electronic flow sheet has been addressed. So there's no requirement on it. I mean, if you do one or the other, it's okay. Just gotta make sure that you're cognizant of the date and time of those entries. Um, inpatient beds for level four. So someone asked, um, are level four facilities required to have inpatient beds? Well, the simple answer is there's no requirement regarding inpatient beds at a level four trauma center. Uh, we're currently not doing verification for level fours. I know some states do it independently, um, but for verification purposes or even in the resources manual, we don't have any standards for this. Uh, moving on to CD-related um, questions. Um, ongoing prof professional practice evaluation. Does the TMD review only general and trauma surgery or do they review ED, radiology, anesthesia, neuro, and ortho providers as well? The answer is no. Uh, the trauma medical director is not expected to perform an OPP on the subspecialist or specialist for that matter. Um, the OPPE for those other specialists should be performed by their respective directors with oversight by the TMD. So anesthesia, radiology, neuro, they're all going to have their own OPPE process and that will be performed by their um, respective directors. And um, again, the trauma medical director uh, will have some oversight over that only because, um, as it says in the next paragraph, the depth of the OPPE will vary. So one of the things you want to capture in the OPPE or report card, people just calling it different things, it should include the surgeon's performance, especially if they're on the trauma call um, schedule, the surgeon's performance activities, um, attendance to peer review, CME tracking, or any corrective action uh, review that that uh, physician has undergone. Uh, alternate pathway to non, I think this meant non, to non-boarded uh, physicians previously approved through alternate pathway required to redo alternate pathway. If not required to do alternate pathway again, do we have to pay for specialty reviewer? Um, great question. So surgeons who, surgeons or physicians who were previously approved through the alternate pathway um, and are still at the same trauma center are not required to repeat the process. Um, if those physicians have moved and moved to a new facility, they will be required to repeat the process and will incur a fee. So for those that were previously approved at the facility, they're, they're not going to be required to repeat the process, and a, nor will a specialty reviewer be on the team, nor will they incur an additional fee for that. Uh, the only time you will incur a fee or need the specialty reviewer is when it's a new, um, a new provider who is undergoing the alternate pathway 
at your facility or if they've moved. Again, I just want to stress that this does not apply to any surgeon who has trained in the U.S. or in Canada. Um, question about um, ATLS and emergency physicians. Can you please clarify the ATLS? CME requirement for pediatricians not board certified in EM working in the ED, do they only need to meet these requir requirements if they respond to trauma team activations? What about treating injured patients? Can they be oversighted by an EM physician and still be involved in the care of the injured, patient, injured children without ATLS and CME? So again, very busy slide, and the easiest way to respond to all these questions is this. In a level one, two, and three trauma center, physicians uh, who provide care to trauma patients, whether they're adult patients or children, regardless if they're part of the trauma team, trauma team activation, they must be current in their boards, uh, meaning they have to be board certified. And if they're board certified, say, and something other, Else, other than emergency medicine like family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics, the physician has to be current in ATLS and meet the CME IEP requirements. So for any provider, if they're not boarding in emergency medicine but will be providing care in the ED, they are required to meet the same if not a little more because they have to be current in ATLS, but they have to be currently boarded and have to, uh, I'm sorry, have to be boarded and meet the CME requirements. So a couple of questions about research. Um, can you explain, break down the research requirement for a level one trauma center? Um, the level one trauma center must have, so this is, there's two portions to the research requirement. There's the research requirement for 20 peer reviewed and then the next slide is gonna cover um, the alternate to having 20 peer reviewed articles. So the first one is a level one trauma center, and this is um, this is a must for a level two, it's desired, it's, it's a should, it's not required, but level one must have 20 peer review articles published. We will accept those that have been um, what we're calling accepted or approved within the three year period leading up to the site visit. So you can't repeat these articles, so they have to be within the three-year period. Um, at least one article must be authored or co-authored by general or trauma surgery. Um, articles authored or co-authored from at least three of the disciplines noted below, and there's actually um, more listing in the next slide. So you have basic science, neurosurgery, emergency medicine, um, all the other specialties, we did add to this list acute care. Um, that is a new uh, addition and that is in the clarification document. The research alternate pathway um, is an alternate to having 20 peer reviewed articles. And what that really means is that we, you do still need to have 10 peer review articles published or again accepted within the three year period and demonstration of trauma-related scholarly activities in four of the following areas. So you have leadership in major trauma organizations. What that means is active committee work, um, that being your East Conference, the American College of Surgery, uh, American College of Surgeons, um, the COT, in the COT com uh, Committee on Trauma, um, any work related to that, uh, WST, uh, the West Trauma Conference, uh, Pediatric Trauma Society, any of those um, lead leadership or major trauma organizations are acceptable. Um, peer review funding for trauma research, um, again, that, um, you know, that could be through governmental agencies, private agencies like foundations, uh, commercial injury prevention efforts, et cetera. Uh, evidence of dissemination of knowledge um, that may include publication of review articles, book chapters, technical documents. Um, uh, these are further opportunities for trauma leaders to be involved in key aspects of trauma education within um, your own institution and your own region. Um, uh, published trauma-related case reports, visiting professors or invited lecture, lectures, um, resident participation in scholarly activities, um, and trauma critical care or acute care uh, surgery fellowship. So um, we just need four of those uh, areas and 10 
research um, peer review articles to meet the alternate. So it could be one or the other. And this is just a snapshot of um, chapter 19, page 146. Um, again, the only thing that's not on here for option number one is acute care um, that is in the clarification document uh, because it uh, came after the book was uh, printed. So just want to just provide a snapshot of what that is. Uh, trauma team activation limited tier. What time should the trauma team activation arrive arrival to a level two activation B? So this question comes up a lot. There's been a lot of discussion out there about this. Um, and really, we have not established a response time for the second tier or the consultation tier. Um, we only have it for the highest tier, which is 15 for ones and twos, and 30 minutes for a level three. So the institution will establish the time and mechanism of injury for when they want the trauma surgeon, whether it's adult or pediatric, to respond to either the limited tier or and or the consultation tier. Um, so most centers, and again, this is going to vary on the mechanism of injury in your region, um, most centers have that metric established between two to six hours two to eight hours, it just depends on the me mechanism of injury. So whatever your trauma center is going to establish, the, the takeaway is that those response times, you're tracking, number one, you're tracking it, you're tracking the response times, you're tracking, um, if there's any delay, then you're reviewing those through your peer review. Um, that essentially is what um, the takeaway is and what the reviewers are going to look at at the time of the site visit. So you want to make sure you're covering those. Uh, orthopedic backup call schedule. Are we required to have a backup orthopedic call schedule if we have a contingency plan to transfer? So we don't ask for a contingency plan for orthopedic. Um, the requirement is that they're either dedicated to your institution or that they have an effective backup cost system. And that system can include um, either, um, if you have residents, it's going to be a PGY4 or higher, um, or a fellow, or even an advanced practice provider. Again, if they're going to act as a primary consult, um, there has to be some guidelines of what the advanced practice providers or PGY4 fellows or PGY4 residents and fellows are going to respond to and what the attending is going to respond to. Um, so, uh, so it is acceptable for them to do to respond. Um, I guess my concern would be, or the concern would be, that if you're a level two trauma center um, that um, is routinely transferring cases that they should be managing, um, and not necessarily specialty or complex injuries, that may be a red flag for the reviewers. Um, at the time of the site visit. So um, I would just caution that you look at that practice and um, make sure that uh, those cases that are being transferred um, are cases um, that you can manage um, at your facility. Uh, and again, just want to stress that all transfers um, must undergo PIPs review and that's CD4-3. Um, our level three trauma centers that keep minor neurologic, neurosurgical trauma trauma responsible to have ICP monitoring capability. Um, great question for level threes. Um, as you know, level threes are not required to have neurosurgery. However, um, based on this question, if it's minor, I'm going to assume that maybe they're keeping the patient for 23 hours abs and to discharging home, so they're not required to keep them. But if it's a trauma center, if it's a level three trauma center, that does have neural capabilities, then the expectation would be that they do have um, ICP monitoring uh, equipment available. So again, if it's a minor in the sense that 23 hours OBS and just discharging them, it's not required. Um, question, we have plastic surgery coverage. However, we do we need to have plastic surgery coverage call 24-7? This is a level two. Both questions are from level two. Uh, we have the special Specialists listed, however, as we are a smaller level two facility, we only have one plastic surgeon, so do we, so we do not have continuous plastic coverage. ENT does help with some of this. Are we required to have plastics on call? Um, both great, great questions. Uh, the expectation is that the trauma center has plastic surgery coverage. Um, 
the surgeon is not required to be in house. They're not required to be in house 24/7. That the expectation is that um, that there has to be a plastic surgeon or consultant available um, when within a predetermined time um, that they are notified by the surgical trauma team. Um, so basically, what this comes down to is that what the surveyors want to see is that you have someone's name on the on-call schedule that says they're going to cover plastics should they need should they need someone to to respond to that so um you can't just have someone's name just rattle it off you have to have that documented so it doesn't necessarily have to be a call surgery call coverage it just means you have to have someone's name on um whether it's the on-call trauma surgery call schedule just have someone's name listed on there um and also for facial trauma uh, OMFS um, and ENT are acceptable to cover for plastic surgery, so that is acceptable. Um, can you please clarify CD 18-3, all patients that meet NCDS trauma inclusion criteria with the hospital stay of 24 hours, 80% universal, is not the full brief screening, is this correct? Um, I don't know if they meant to put not in there, but I don't think it belongs there. Um, when auditing for expert screening, does length of stay for admission start when they are registered in the ED or admitted inpatient? Um, both great questions. So the way this um, looks now is that level one and level three, level one, two, and three trauma centers, all patients that meet NTDS trauma inclusion criteria that are admitted to your trauma center with the uh, length of stay greater than 24 hours, at least 80% of those patients must receive screening for alcohol, and that must be documented. Um, and then in level one and two trauma centers, um, they have to ensure those patients that who screen positive receive an intervention. Uh, there is a typo in the clarification document, and I will go ahead and um, fix that. Um, and the next clarification that goes out, because right now it says level one and two, level one, two, and three require the experts, but it's really level one and two that require the, the um, intervention. Uh, we're just gonna move on to CME. I had a couple of questions about CME and conferences. Um, a reviewer told us we can accept a third of conference CMEs for trauma if we can't verify the exact number. Is this correct? That is not correct. Um, all CMEs must be verifiable, meaning the reviewers are gonna look at those on site and determine whether or not you have um, um, documentation to support that they're trauma related. So all CMEs must be verifiable as external or internal trauma related. The review team, what I'm thinking may have happened, and again, I'm not sure, um, that um, they may have confused the one third with what we're allowing trauma centers to do is allow 33 hours of CME for um, any physician or any surgeon who has um, taken their boards or reboard or, or who's taking their boards for initial boards or recertification um, within the three years leading up to a site visit. That's what I think may have happened. I'm not sure, but I, uh, um, but we, a third of conferences, and um, if you can't verify them, that, that's gonna be a red flag. If you have any questions about this, I'm happy to discuss it with you on the phone so you can reach out to me. Um, CME for non-liaisons, um, a reviewer told us non-liaisons must have at least 50% of their CMEs as external. Is that correct? Uh, again, that is not correct, but it's also not wrong. Um, what I will say about this is the non-liaisons may they have an option to demonstrate trauma education by acquiring a minimum of 48 hours of trauma-related, verifiable external or internal uh, trauma-related CME over three years by participating in the trauma center's internal education process or uh, through a combination of CME and IEP. So. Um, I wouldn't say the 50% is a threshold. I would say it's an option. So if you want to do 50% external trauma, uh, uh, external CME and the remainder internal CME or through an IEP, that's perfectly acceptable. 
acceptable for non liaisons um, as long as they have 48 hours um, that's what we're we're expecting internal CME can CME count as external if the hospital is the one who grants it but does not facilitate contribute to the content or plan it um, or plan plan the the education um, so I can go a couple of ways with this because I just don't have a lot of information on this, but the way I'm reading this is um, it is acceptable for the land liaisons to use that as internal CME um, because the way it sounds to me, it's something that was possibly brought into the hospital um, either by having grand rounds or having a, a invited speaker come in. Um, if that's the case, then that would be considered internal CME. Um, the um, what we're asking if that's the case that it must the topic must be um, trauma related uh, and again uh, usually that falls into one of the following settings in service lectures educational conferences grand round lectures um, an internal trauma symposium uh, symposium or an in-house in publication so um, that's that was my takeaway from this question if it's uh, um, if that's not correct please feel free to reach out to me and I will clarify that further CME documentation, does proof of CME have to include the actual certificate or can it just be a log of titles and credits for that class course? Um, it has to be, so this is what I'm gonna say. Um, at the time of the site visit, if you are using, if you're not using transcripts and you're gonna use the certificate, because um, now there are transcripts up there, but if you're using, um, if you're not using transcripts, then you're gonna, need to have those CME certificates along with the conference brochures. Um, if you're using transcripts, you don't have to pull the certificates, but you're gonna need, in both scenarios, you're gonna need uh, to demonstrate that the course uh, was um, trauma-related um, and how many hours of that is trauma. So you're gonna need the outline or the brochure that um, that states what that is. So again, um, at the time of the site visit, it is required that the trauma center provide copies of its trauma-related CME certificates along with the conference brochures. Uh, because again, the certificates may not necessarily say trauma, it'll just say CME. Uh, transcripts are acceptable. However, the center must provide detail of the hours that are trauma-related. This can be demonstrated with the course outline or brochure. In both scenarios, um, the above may be supported with a log of se the session titles and credits for each one. So you can have a spreadsheet that kind of breaks it down for the reviewers and that'll be, that actually, they, they love that stuff. CME pediatric liaisons. Please discuss the CME requirement for pediatrics, both liaisons and others. Um, Pediatric non-liaison CME, I'll cover in the next slide. So this one is just for the liaisons and the trauma medical director, that being the pediatric trauma medical director. Um, they must demonstrate trauma education by acquiring a minimum of 48 hours, of which 12 hours must be related to critical, um, I'm sorry, related to clinical pediatric trauma care um, of external trauma-related CME over a three-year period. So. For pediatric trauma centers, it's 48 hours, of which 12 hours must, must be pediatric specific. For um, the non-liaisons, um, a level one, level two pediatric trauma centers, the non-liaisons may demonstrate trauma education by acquiring, again, 48 hours, of which 12 must be related to pediatric trauma care of external or internal trauma-related or again, this can be through the internal education process. So you can use a combination uh, for your non-liaison. So however you're gonna break this down, internal, external, IEP, you wanna make sure you have some kind of documentation, uh, summary, some documentation summary for the reviewers that breaks this down on how you're um, capturing that information to make it that much easier for um, the reviewers to see that. Uh, CME prorated, got several questions on this. Um, hopefully, um, the following couple of slides will be um, helpful. Uh, we had an ED provider just start a month before our review cycle ends. What is the CME requirement 16 or prorated to 1.3? 
please uh, specify different ways to prorate CMEs. So if the ED provider cited a month before the review cycle ended, they would need one hour CME. Ideally, and I say this um, in the next couple of slides, ideally if the ED provider or any provider for that matter came from another trauma center, the expectation is that they have acquired some CME at some point in time. Um, and that can be brought over to your trauma center and used with whatever um, CME they're going to obtain at your facility. So if they don't have any CMEs, then we'll go ahead and revert to it's going to be prorated based on the time they are present at your facility. Um, for recent graduates or absences for military duty, medical leave, and missionary work, CMEs uh, may be prorated or will be prorated. Again, we'll need documentation that um, they're a recent graduate, military duty, medical leave, missionary work, et cetera. So here are a few examples. Um, so this question is asking if an EDMD is brand new, say they started in 2016 and our verification dates are 2015 to 2018, how many CMEs are collected for this position? So as noted in the previous slide, CMEs may be prorated based on the time the new provider started at the started on the service leading up to the site visit. So again, these are my assumptions. Based on the time frame provided and, and, and the following scenario, let's say the provider started in July of 2016 and the visit takes place December of 2018, the breakdown would be six hours for 2016, 16 for 2017, and 16 for 2018. Again, I'm basing this off of the scenario I've provided. Um, similar question, just a different time, um, a different um, time frame um, based on the time frame. And again, I'm making an assumption here. If um, the provider um, started in August, as it says here, and say your visit is in December of 2018, the breakdown will be five hours for 2017 and 16 hours for 2018. Again, um, that's a, an assumption. Locum, please review locum provider requirements for critical care and trauma surgery pertaining to CME and trauma meeting attendance. So over time, we've had a lot of questions about locums. And again, um, locums that are, are, are providing care to trauma patients and are on the trauma call panel are required to meet the same standards as your other panel members. Um, and again, if I understand the, the question correctly, uh, trauma surgery locums who provide care to trauma patients are required to meet the same st requirements as the other trauma members, such as for certification. They have to undergo OPPE, attend trauma peer review if they're trauma surgeons, um, and acquire a CME. Um, if there's locums providing care in the ICU, this will exclude attending trauma peer review because, again, that is only extended to the ICU liaison or predetermined provider um, that, to attend those peer review meetings. Um, would you please elaborate on the 63017 clarification document uh, regarding ICU, and, um, ICU coverage, patient care is transferred to them? So. Um, this is stated in the clarification document. I don't know if I can be, it can be any clearer. Um, it states that if the intensivist is the primary physician responsible for the care of the patient while in the ICU, meaning the patient's care is transferred to the intensivist, they are required to maintain external trauma related to me and or through the IEP process or a combination of both. Intensivists that are in the ICU managing pulmonary or medical issues to a trauma patient are not required to meet the CME requirement. Um, I will say that this last statement is not in the clarification document, but I will go ahead and add that in the next uh, clarification document that I'm going to release tomorrow. Um, so that is a clarification on that. And that uh, concludes our webinar for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, I guess we'll see you next month. Thank you. And thank you, the trauma verification staff. And thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar, Trauma Verification's August Q&A web conference. If you have any other questions, please contact cotvrc at fax.org. And on behalf of Trauma Verification and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.